Welcome to Environmental Health Trust's Patreon webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about the FCC's reply brief. Good morning. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Dr. Deborah Davis, and I'm delighted to be with you uh, for um, this quick update on this 87-page um, brief that the FCC has just filed in response to our um, critical lawsuit. Um, in its response, the FCC basically confirms that it feels that there's nothing new in science in the past 24 years. Kind of amazing, considering what other countries have done. Um, the United States seems to be determined to go it alone and ignore what other high-tech countries um, have pointed out. Um, in particular, um, the FCC denies that there are any non-thermal effects of radio frequency radiation, electromagnetic fields. They make that denial uh, in the face of growing evidence on the damaging effects on sperm, which I've talked about here and in my TEDx talk as well. And they also totally reject the uh, need to protect those who are electrosensitive, um, arguing that uh, these, quote, allegedly sensitive individuals um, do not require special protection, which flies in the face, uh, again, of what many localities in this country have done and what many countries are moving to do to recognize that there are individuals who do suffer greatly from their exposures. Um, in addition um, to rejecting completely the relevance of the Americans for Disabilities Act without, without really much argument at all, it asserts over and over again, quote, the limits uh, the information developed since it has adopted the limits has not changed the scientific consensus that the limits remain safe and adequate to protect public health. That is not correct. That does not reflect the latest scientific understanding of more than uh, 400 scientists who have petitioned the United Nations on this issue. Um, <clears throat> and it refers to earlier court decisions and earlier findings of the courts based in 20, 2003, 1997, 2013, 2009. It's relying on outdated scientific information to justify the action that it's taking in 2020. I find this would be incredible. What if NASA decided they were gonna fly the space shuttle with information based on 20 year old science? People, people would, would be standing in the streets arguing that they cannot do this. Um, they further say that there is, they do not need to review the relevance of the NEPA Act uh, because it does not provide a seriously different picture of the environmental landscape right now. And again, that is arguing that there's been very little change in the world <clears throat> since 1996 when these standards were, uh, were first um, developed. Um, and as to the legality of those, we have outstanding attorneys working with us who we're sure are going to make, make, make those arguments. But they also disclose some things in this um, reply that I think are quite interesting. On page uh, 68, um, they say that they, quote, reasonably declined to propose a requirement that cell phones be tested with no separation from the body. They say that. Why do they, what do they base it on? They base it on um, the misleading statement that phones are already tested directly next to the head. They are not, they are not. Phones are tested with a big empty bowling ball head of a 220 pound guy weighing approximately 12 pounds. And there's a pinna distance, it's a fancy name for the ear, and that distance has varied between 10 millimeters to five millimeters, but it's a distance. Now, why is that distance important? First of all, any of you like me who've reached a certain age of distinction have difficulty hearing generally, and people uh, tend to put the phone smack against their head as hard as they can to hear, sometimes not realizing that the speakers come out of the bottom of the phone, for example, and you're holding it here isn't gonna help you. You wanna actually hold it with a speakerphone and actually not hold it, but have it away from you and only use it when it's absolutely necessary. So they argue that because phones are tested against the head, and they're not, 
therefore the testing is realistic. They further argue that it should be continue to be legal, which it is now, to test radiation from the phone an inch off the body, as though the phone was being held in a holster. Let me know the last time you've seen people keeping their phones in holsters. But in this brief, they also say um, that sometimes they call for less separation than 2.5 centimeters, quote, for example, phone mode, I'll explain that in a moment, are tested at a maximum separation distance from the body of one centimeter. Well, hotspot mode, now, do you know what that is? The hotspot mode refers to the fact that your phone can serve as a hotspot for somebody else to go and uh, receive or send wireless messages. And you may not know when your phone is being used in that way, depending on what passwords and things you've put into your system or whether it's an automatic hotspot. And a hotspot means what it says. It is in fact hotter. It does bring in uh, more radiation. And for that reason, the FCC in its wisdom does require a one centimeter distance. So you have to ask yourself if you need one centimeter distance for a hotspot, why wouldn't you need it all the time since all of these phones are programmed so they go to max power when they need to. And among the times that they need to is whenever a signal is one bar or two bars, they're weak, they have to go to max power. That means the maximum radiation is being emitted. And if a phone is next to your body or in your pocket, it is going to exceed um, those uh, exposure guidelines uh, substantially. And that is not just a theoretical argument. In 2010, when I wrote my book, Disconnect, I said that if phones were tested the way they were used, they would be found to be illegal. And by that I meant, if phones were tested in the pocket or close to the body, they would be exceeding the radiation limits that have been set. Now, in the last year, the Chicago Tribune paid for independent testing to confirm this. The year before, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, a public funded system in Canada, showed the same thing, namely that when phones are tested directly next to the body in the pocket, they exceed the current limits which were set to avoid heating only. So we now know <clears throat> that the phones are set so that they can be hot spots. And we also know that they're not tested directly next to the head or body, contrary to what they say. Further, they have the gall to assert that because the head, the whole head of this large adult absorbs more radiation than the whole head of a child, therefore, this big head protects the child. This isn't about the head. This is about the brain the developing brain of the child, which because the child's skull is thinner, because the brain has more fluid, the child's brain is growing much faster, even if the radiation were identical, and it's not. The child's brain will absorb more radiation. And this fact has been uttered by the World Health Organization. It has been declared by the scientists who do research for Orange, the leading telecom researcher in um, France, and many other researchers, including a team of researchers that Environmental Health Trust works with in Brazil, with Claudio Fernandes and Alvaro de Salas, have all shown the same thing, which is that the bone marrow of a child's head can absorb 10 times more radiation than that of an adult, the bone marrow. And bone marrow, of course, is responsible for making blood. In addition, parts of the brain critical to thinking and impulse control, like the hippocampus, of, are getting extra exposure as well with the young developing brain. So the FCC says the, quote, the mannequin, meaning this big guy brain, we call him standard anthropomorphic mannequin, or SAM for short. The mannequin, they say, tends to overestimate exposure of the heads for most adults and children because it's designed based on the dimension of large heads. Of course it is but we're not concerned about the head. We're concerned about the brain and specific parts in it. And this is ludicrous. And whoever advised these attorneys didn't understand basic biology, but that's not surprising because right now, it's my understanding that the FCC employs almost no people with expertise in bioelectromagnetics. It's training people on the job, 
but they lost one of their most talented long-term employees who had worked in this field. And right now, their understanding of biology, as is evidenced by the statement they make about the head, is actually pitiful. They uh, argue further that um, it's okay to use this empty bowling ball because um, it's standing in for all the different parts of the brain, some of which are very dense, some of which ha uh, are very fluid. <coughs> and it includes, by the way, this thing called the eye, which has no cooling mechanism. And right now, there are a number of other devices that are also approved to be placed right on the forehead, right close to the eye of young children that can emit levels of radiation that we know do induce heat. And that is another issue that they refuse to uh, protect. And they do uh, recognize that there, is, there was debate, but they say that they decided that the debate is not important enough to drive them to um, make any change in protecting children. Um, this is despite the growing evidence as in the movie on Netflix that I have to recommend you watch, Wired, called Social Dilemma, where the inventors of this technology that we are all now so captured by talk about the ways that they recognize that the design of the technology has been to addict children in particular, and the people who were designers themselves about several years ago, many of them had epiphanies when they realized they couldn't put it down, that they had become trapped to the technology that they had themselves built. It's a common, commonly understood in environmental health that uh, children are more vulnerable, but children are not little adults. You don't just scale down exposures and say, well, now it's safe for children because a child weighs half an adult, so we cut the toxic exposure in half. Because their bodies and brains are still developing, and when you have fast-growing cells, and especially the brain, there can be uh, very serious impacts that happen and also are not even known until later in life for various exposures. So One example that we're seeing now is growing numbers of very young children who are requiring eyeglasses. And um, many um, ophthalmologists and pediatricians are right, quite concerned that although it's, it can be very convenient to distract a, ch a young child with a small screen, um, this is actually shortening their focal length and creating, uh, inducing myopia and other vision problems uh, much earlier in life <clears throat> than we would have seen them. So that um, the issue that before the court is, did the, does the FCC adequately protect public health? And we think the answer is pretty clear. The answer is no. But ironically, in this reply brief, which I find beyond chutzpah, the FCC on page 17 of 87 says, moreover, no commenter has proposed any changes to existing protections that were supported or justified by scientifically rigorous data or analysis. In other words, we commenters, of which Environmental Health Trust has been a commenter for a decade or more, and many of the people joining in this suit, Children's Health Defense as well, have been involved in this for a long time. We are now being tasked with having not come up with an alternative for them. That's not my job. That's not my job to come up with an alternative. My job is to say, what you have now does not work. The Chicago Tribune shows it. There are lawsuits now on behalf of many people who are suffering from brain cancer uh, or uh, other issues relating to their cell phone use. And <clears throat> these are all based on new science, which the agency has refused to recognize. When last year, with no, with no further comment, they had opened a record in 2013, and at the end of 2019, just before the Christmas holiday, they slipped out this notice that they're closing the record. That's it. The record's closed. Now, under the Administrative Procedure Act, agencies are responsible to go through records and show a rational basis of doing so. In this reply brief, they show just the opposite. They do not address any of the specific comments that have been made by many of the scientists who've done research in this field. And they conclude, quote, 
the weight of scientific and health evidence, particularly in the judgment of federal agencies, expert in health matters, demonstrated that no changes were warranted. Well, let me tell you a little secret. The so-called federal health agencies have been hamstrung, handicapped, and really prevented from in, in engaging in this issue. Scientists retired from the government now, like Professor Ronald Melnick, who has done an excellent job of explaining this, have gone into great detail about why the National Toxicology Program study is so important to this case. And by the way, the FCC dismisses it with the back of the hand with no more explanation than it offered in the first place. There is no substantial analysis of the NTP study except to quote one of the scientists who said it wasn't relevant to humans. Well, that one scientist happens to be wrong because the methods used by the National Toxicology Program are the methods that have been used to test pharmacology, toxicology, toxic substances, and radiation for more than 40 years. I was involved in helping to set up the National Toxicology Program in the late in the 1980s. And what happened with that program early on was a recognition that we test animals in order to predict effects in humans so as to allow regulatory agencies to reduce exposure, prevent exposure, or sometimes limit it altogether. Um, let me give you an example. Um, the National Toxicology Program has studied arsenic and asbestos. Those are two very important uh, environmental carcinogens. Neither one of them causes genetic damage, by the way. We cannot find evidence of direct genetic damage, but they both are carcinogens. Why do we know that? Because we have human beings with statistically significant evidence of tumors. So now here's the thing that the FCC fails to take into account. Every agent that we know causes cancer in people will produce it in animals when adequately studied. That's why we test animals, not to prove that whether or not people have cancer from animals, but in order to prevent, in order to develop policies to protect public health and the environment. And that is where we are right now. The agency has relied not on a systematic review, not on an analysis of the thousands of submissions it received from 2013 to 2019, and prior to that, to thousands others that were submitted by other groups who've been working on this for a long, long time, um, such as the people from uh, New England um, who have uh, tried uh, nobly to make the case about antennas and radiation for, for years. Um, we have, at this point, evidence that there is effects, and what the agency has failed to do is to establish a record of rational review. Normally, what agencies do is hire contractors to review the submitted information. That's what they do. They didn't do that. They didn't bother. And not only that, they changed the coding for the database that was receiving all of this. And as a consequence of that, nobody at the agency actually knew what was in the record. We could show that, actually, and we will show that, that there is a failure to look adequately at the submitted information. And as a consequence, um, the FCC is really, I think, flying blind, just as uh, the senator uh, pointed out uh, some time ago. Um, they completely blow out of the water the need to look at um, the National Environmental Protection Act. They, they completely re reject it. Uh, again, how you can assert that a 21st century technology that doesn't even exist fully yet, like 5G, is going to be safe when you test it with 20th century standards, I find that hard for any rational person uh, to accept. The FCC is relying on the FDA as the F they say that the FDA says there's no reason to change limits and they put forward that this the statements that are online in a letter from the FDA and then say, well, later the FDA came out with a report. Well, if you, if we were afforded the opportunity to look at that report, which we were a few weeks ago when it finally came out after the FCC determination, it is a literature review uh, that 
uh, dismisses and downplays the studies that find effects. Uh, we don't know who wrote it, what scientists were involved, and we have a whole press release on Environmental Health Trust. It's now on our YouTube channel that you can watch where we uh, call for the, FD, the FDA to retract that report uh, because for many, many problems with that report. But the most important thing about it, even if you thought that it was true, is that it's only about cancer. It doesn't talk about impacts to brain, impacts to reproduction. And it certainly does not talk about impacts to bees, trees, birds, insects, or the environmental effects of which the FCC record was filled with but completely ignored. So the FCC is not being accountable to protecting the environment. Let's talk about just one example on the insects. Recently, <clears throat> engineers with the Swiss National Institute that evaluates and makes the models actually that the FDA uses to estimate exposure into the virtual family, <clears throat> that team also did a, a three-dimensional model of a honeybee. And they, they showed that with exposure to what the 5G beams would be, the honeybee would resonate, would absorb more radiation than it than seemed advisable. They said that in their article, that there will be dangers with the current standards and that these, these animals, these bees, on which agriculture depends, could be uh, imperiled. Now, we know there are many things affecting bees right now, including neonicotinoid pesticides and other pesticides. So it's not like one size fits all. That's part of what makes environmental studies so challenging. But I will tell you right now that if we go ahead with the proliferation that is being planned in some areas, um, we are going to endanger our pollinating insects. And that's not a risk that I think should be taken. I think one of the things that's missing from this reply is any consideration of the impact on space. And I know that uh, our colleagues, uh, Jillian Gresser and Joe Sandry and others are making a very strong argument um, for why the launching of uh, 40,000 satellites at this point would be um, detrimental to space exploration, detrimental to predicting hurricanes, um, and interfering with marine navigation. Now, it would seem to me that when you've got experts from NASA and NOAA writing to the FCC, asking them to rethink their plans with respect to this, that that should be taken seriously. And that's um, just not even addressed as an issue. In the electromagnetic radiation network, uh, the group from New England I was referring to before, when they sued in, in 2003, um, they argued that the FCC had failed to rely on outdoor, outside experts in its analysis. And the court ruled that the FCC was within its uh, limits uh, to do that. But now it's not 2003. It's 2020, it's 17 years later. And you know what? Other federal governments have actually tasked their expert scientists with reviewing the science and have come up with very, very different conclusions, which is why uh, you can look at our website, uh, ehtrust.org, and you will find all the uh, evolution of what has been happening in France and some of what has happened in the past in Israel. Um, we think that uh, the arguments uh, to uphold our position are quite strong, that the failure to protect children can't even be debated. They don't, they don't even debate it. They simply talk about the head uh, of an adult versus a child and not the brain. That fails utterly to understand the most basic parts about, that we know about developmental um, neurology and that the current limits fail to take into account the fact that children are often using these devices with arms that are too short, you know? In other words, um, a laptop is tested eight inches off of this large adult male body. And how many times do we give a little kid something and it, they hold it directly on their body? We really, really should not do that. All, any device that a child uses should be plugged in, wired, if, if, if at all possible, disconnected from Wi-Fi if, they're, if they have to look at something, and, and always on a table and never on the body. Um, the, I, I mentioned before the assertion they make that the phones are tested at zero distance from the head, and they're not. They, 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 they're ignoring their own ruling. They, they issued a pinna and said um, what they were doing. 
Um, and um, I, at this point, I'd like to just mention two new publications that, um, one of which I think is particularly relevant. And I wondered if I could share something that I'm working on right now. I think the, the one that is um, available somewhere on our website, right, um, is an analysis showing that the risk of colon and rectal cancer in people born recently who are under the age of 40 is much, much higher, up to four times higher than for people who were born in the 1940s. Now, why would you have a fourfold increase in a very rare disease? Rectal cancer is not supposed to happen in people in their 30s. And it's happening more and more for people in their 30s and 40s, so much so that they change the, the age for screening. But this isn't about screening, in our opinion. There are a number of interesting experimental studies that indicate that the colon is especially sensitive to radiofrequency radiation. And some of them have been done in, by a group of scientists in Iran at the Ionizing and Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection Research Center of Shiraz University. Now, whatever our issues with Iran, they have, like a lot of other countries, including Turkey and Israel, they have an institute that is devoted to looking at ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. The French have the same. This institute actually conducted experimental work where they took colorectal cells, which you can culture, and they exposed them to um, radiofrequency radiation levels uh, that would be consistent with what we could get from current phones, not, not 5G, just current phones, 3G and 4G. And they looked at certain proteins in those cells that are known to be predictive of cancer, hypermethylated proteins. And they found that after exposure to ionizing radiation, there was a certain pattern of increased risk ionizing, but they found the same pattern after non-ionizing. In other words, yes, we know that x-rays, ionizing radiation, are damaging. Nobody debates that. For years, the FCC has said, well, this is non ionizing This study, damaging effects from non-ionizing radiation, you can get from cell phones. That's what this study showed. So in our article, we show that work. And then I'm going to try to show this. And if you look at the bottom, these, these, these two figures here on the, uh, are the both co birth cohorts for colon on the left and rectum on the right, okay? And look at the bottom where this thing, this is going up. This is the youngest people. The trend is going up for the youngest and down for the oldest. Now, next time you see a young person with their tights and their phone slipped right in there. You might want to tell them to look at our website. Um, you might want to tell them to think about the exposure and the fact is phones are tested off the body. They are tested up to an inch off the body. That's what the FCC says. And yet phones are being used directly on the body. So uh, there's other work that's consistent with this. Uh, you know, even if phones are at a distance, you're still receiving the pulses of wireless radiation. So even if you're with compliant with FCC limits, you're not protected. But what is so egregious is that even if we thought that those limits were protective, when you use the devices like you normally would, like people do all the time, putting them in their pocket, resting them on their abdomen. I saw someone sit on their phone the other day just to keep it in a good place while they were staying seated, uh, that those positions you can exceed FCC allowable limits. And the FCC, uh, has promoted certainly in the past and you'll hear from industry. Oh, there's a 50 times safety factor. Well, there is no 50 times safety factor. Uh, even if we believe the regulations, especially when it comes to the devices themselves, this is a piece of misinformation that is promoted by industry. I'm going to find a link to the paper and put it up as well, Dr. Davis. Yes, I think that would be good. And then the last thing I wanted to share before I have to go and sorry for the, um, interruption there, um, involves what I, what I'm, uh, something I'm thinking of writing and I would welcome, <clears throat> I'd like to read part of it and I would welcome feedback from the Patreon members of what they think we should include or change. 
this is being uh, written for a major international publication because uh, it seems to be more challenging to get it into the US press. Um, I start out explaining that recently <clears throat> Daimler Chrysler has paid $2 billion in fines to the federal government and the state of California because they sold over a quarter of a billion diesel engines that emitted diesel exhaust 40 times more dangerous than standards allowed. How did they do that? Well, they did it because they created a rigged test system so that whenever the car sensed it was hooked up to a test computer, it would not emit dangerous pollutants. But on the real road, it did. Think about this when you look at those dreadful fires and those orange skies in San Francisco. Some part of that is diesel exhaust that was making it much worse than it would have because there were a quarter of a million cars, many of them in California, on the road with these diesel engines. <clears throat> so another industry may soon find itself in financial and regulatory crosshairs for selling products that rely on bogus test system. And you can guess which one that is. The global multi-trillion dollar telecom business of smartphones and tablets depends utterly on 24-year-old radiation exposure test systems that have never been evaluated for health or environmental impacts. Microwave radiation from phones is evaluated assuming that the device is kept up to an inch off the body and the only effect to be avoided is that of heating. Radiation from laptops, still being used by millions of young school kids, is tested at about eight inches from a large adult male body. Well, I, we talked before about the Tribune test. In response, the FCC yesterday affirmed that its outdated test system remains valid and that heat is the only effect of concern. It also declared, alleged, that no scientific information, no new scientific information had been obtained to justify taking any changes. Well, there's something wrong with this picture. First of all, for the past two decades, telecom firms have operated without insurance. They can't get insurance for their operations. Secondary insurance, like Lloyd's of London and Swiss Re, that provide backup for business, have refused to cover health or environmental damages for mobile phones and other devices for, for two decades. And just last year, before COVID-19, Swiss Re, a multi-billion dollar secondary insurance firm, issued a report and it termed the untested 5G technology off the leash, the same category as mad cow disease, asbestos, and other previously unpredictable risks. Business liability is a big deal here because many, many firms are requiring their employees to be using phones, and the Italian Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a worker who developed a tumor in his head because his job required him to use the mobile phone. And in that ruling, the Supreme Court of Italy said that there was little evidence of harm in the industry-funded studies in contrast to findings of harm in independent studies and therefore gave more weight to the independent studies, such as those that we've done with our colleagues in Brazil, um, Alvaro de Salas and Claudio Fernandez, in Canada with Professor Anthony B. Miller and others. The government of France, as some of you know, has conducted independent measurements of phone radiation for years. Uh, the French Standards Authority, we don't really have anything quite like it, found that 40, 400 models of cell phones exceeded the standard for exposure um, by three to five times the limit of the French, which is in fact a higher limit than we have. They allow more radiation in their phones. Um, Marc Arazi, a physician who founded PhoneGate Alert, has pressed the French government and they have continued to recall phones for exceeding radiation limits. Sometimes the recall only requires a software upgrade to reduce emissions. And similar recommendations have been issued by other governments in high tech countries, Israel, Belgium, France. Where is the United States in all of this? You know, you, this is one planet and the standards for phones that we set influence the entire uh, system. Further, of course, the FDD, FD, FCC has the gall to reject 
the NTP study, which it commissioned and oversaw, oversaw and designed and approved every step along the way. This $30 million study the, it was approved by the FDA officials who are no longer there. Interestingly, the new people who are in charge were very new to this issue, as is apparent by some of the statements that they've made. Although drug development at the FDA depends on the use of animal studies to predict human impacts, as we're seeing all the time, when it comes to environmental predictions, the FDA dismisses the very study it had once requested, designed, and approved. So I want to talk about a new study that's quite technical, but I think very important for what we're trying to um, communicate. And that is a study done by David Gultigan and experts in electrical engineering, uh, including a life fellow of the IEEE. And this study looked at a fresh cow brain that was perfused with fluid and tested it with six minutes of pulsed exposure to a beam forming component of 5G at 39 gigahertz. Now that's, that's a lot, that's a high frequency. That is a currently approved frequency for 5G, right? And they showed that just six minutes of pulsed exposure could in increase temperatures inside the cow brain, which they measured up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 centigrade. Uh, this result is, I think, astonishing and important. It, it is, however, a higher frequency band and a different mechanism that's involved. And the point is that the Department of Defense already has an active denial system, a long range acoustic device that relies on this higher frequency band and a different mechanism to make the skin feel like it's a fire. And some federal officials actually proposed using this to clear the White House Plaza last month rather than the tear gas that they ended up using. Well, we don't know. That's the whole point. We are flying blind. We do not have adequate information. We cannot now estimate how much of our dirty urban skies today is due to these polluting diesel engines. We don't know. But we can be certain that these flawed defeater devices constitute a major contributor to dirty European vistas where the same engines were sold as well. And despite repeated promises by the FCC over many years that we're going to study the problem, the fact is the US government today has almost no research underway at all on the biological effects of any of these forms of radiation, except for classified studies carried out in the military. We know that there's a lot of activity that's going on here that's involved in international issues. And even with respect to China, there is a real important argument to be had about whether control of 5G um, can be achieved or whether open 5G may actually create more freedom and more free markets. I, I don't have a position on that, but I do know this. The question is not no 5G or yes 5G, but how can safer systems be made that address the essential needs for communication and also lessen their public health and environmental impacts? And I would welcome any comments um, on this. It's a, it's a draft. I've just kind of gone over parts of it and um, would appreciate hearing from you with any thoughts you might have including you, Ms. Scarato. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing that with everyone. Um, actually, I was really honored to be here while you read some of your writing. You've published so much, and we have all of that on EH, EHT, if you're interested in more of, of those op-eds that Dr. Davis has written. So I think this is really timely um, and really important. I, I continue to just be... Uh, really speechless that 5G is being put ahead without proper safeguards in place right. to ensure that the technology is safe. I well, mean, actually, I think we should be, we would be remiss not to mention the international Stop 5G Day that is coming up, Yeah. right, in two days. Um, Kate Keel and Doug and Patty Wood, and please make sure we give a shout out to all the people who've been working on this all over the world, because <clears throat> ironically, the United States 
like with climate, is going to have to follow other countries rather than lead. You know, one of the, um, I'll put a link in the chat to the International Stop 5G Day, but Please. it's really important that everyone be advocating to their officials at every level of government about the lack of accountability at the top, at the federal level. Well, or there's a question here or... from Hal Ben Chai. <clears throat> Why do we think the FCC has not taken our request seriously? What are our chances for appeal? All right. <clears throat> well, obviously, we have very strong chances of succeeding in this appeal because the FCC in its arrogance has acted like a supra constitutional agency that does not need to comply with existing federal law. They have asserted they don't need to apply with NEPA. They don't need to apply with the Americans for Disabilities Act. There, there's no justification for that in the law. They've said they don't have to apply with the Administrative Procedures Act. These acts, the this Administrative Procedures Act, has guided the federal government's performance for decades. And the FCC never took seriously the need to provide a rational and systematic record of review of the comments that were received. And further in the <clears throat> mess of the websites uh, of the data system that they established, which we can uh, establish in our record, this is evidence per se of their failure to take the Administrative Procedure Act seriously. If they were serious, they would have hired a consultant, they would have done the analysis, they would have had a, a systematic review of all of the materials submitted. Instead, what they did is they cherry picked, went to the FDA that did a, a selective review only on cancer, ignored all the evidence on damage to sperm, effects on children's memory and spatial recognition, um, sleep, disturbances, which can be very grave. They ignored all of that and simply had a cherry-picked report on some of the studies on cancer that said there's no problem. Now, <clears throat> I think that the courts um, are our, our best hope, and we will make headway with this lawsuit. We will. The grounds for this appeal are so compelling that um, we have a, a number of very, very smart lawyers working on this, and we have little doubt that we will succeed. But even after we succeed, everybody on this call has got to bring 10 more people in and make sure people understand that we're not anti-technology, we're pro-health. And we think the American public has a right to know more than it does know about this technology and to take steps to, to protect themselves accordingly. Take the time, if you're really interested in this, to read the um, briefs, the amicus briefs that were filed, because they, they provide incredibly important information. NRDC talks about how the EPA was defunded from actually doing research on this issue. So the FCC is saying, well, uh, you know, our limits don't need to be changed, but yet there is actually no health and safety agency that is researching to understand the effects in terms of insects, trees, plants, uh, et cetera. And so how can you say that something is fine when there's actually no health and safety agency that has been look, looking into that? And included in the NRDC brief is a uh, letter that was written to me by the director of air and radiation at the EPA, where they, where, um, the director states that they have no funded mandate and that the last review they did on biological effects was in the 1984. So, you know, it's, it's the, the facts are pretty clear. The challenge I think is going to be that uh, the FCC and their industry, uh, uh, industry, uh, industry information that's been cited, of which there is much industry-funded information cited in that brief, can be confusing. And uh, we're really hopeful that the court will take the time to understand this issue and cut through the misinformation that's been presented. And that's, and that's where we need your help, because <clears throat> we, we know what the major issues are, but of course we get just a limited number of words to, to reply. And we have to do a better job of communicating the fact that other experts in other countries have looked at newer data and have decided, in the case of France, they've issued a ruling in July of this year that took effect, which is on our website, which says to avoid exposure to the abdomens of teenagers. If that were made more publicly known, we might be sparing these young people <clears throat> the rectal cancers that are increasing now.
We might. Yeah, I mean, look, I want to be clear. In the paper on rectal cancer, we say <clears throat> there are many different factors that can cause this. Obesity, diabetes, lack of exercise. But one of them is also exposure to radiation <clears throat> from phones in the pocket and CAT scans, because this is the generation that as children may have had a lot of CAT scans, more so than others. And that's a lot of radiation. So we don't know which of these things explains it, but we know there's something that needs an explanation because when it's a rate of cancer changes four to five times in two decades, that is not because of genetics. That is a signal that there are environmental factors that are relevant. That's why we have to pay attention. And, we can, and the other thing you were mentioning about the insects, the FCC says, oh, that study from the Department of Interior was worried just about birds colliding with antennas. No, that's not true. And we, can, we will cite the study and we will say, no, it's about nesting patterns, it's about reproduction, it's about navigation, it's about the cryptochrome. The cryptochrome, crypto meaning hidden, chrome meaning color, is a protein behind the eye of every migrating animal, birds, bees, fruit flies, buffalo, they all have a cryptochrome. And the cryptochrome senses the Earth's magnetic field. That's how hummingbirds fly thousands of miles. They, they don't stop in the middle and take a sight reading. They sense the Earth's magnetic field. We don't fully understand it. It's recently been under, in science, there's research on it right now. But cryptochromes are damaged and can be interfered with by radio frequency radiation. And so, yeah, and I just want to add, in terms of what other countries are doing, India looked at the research on insects, bees, and birds, and they dropped their allowable limits, the ambient from the cell towers, by to one-tenth of what they were before. After reviewing the data and finding uh, the most of the studies showed effects, and as well, Switzerland has uh, much lower allowable levels of radio frequency from antennas, and they did a very large review with uh, a lot of uh, experts and actually could not agree, as normally happens on these commissions. And they ended up proposing three different options. One was to increase the allowable radiation to allow 5G easier. The second was to keep things the same. And the third was to reduce uh, and mitigate uh, exposures even more and ultimately decided to keep the levels as they were. However, when parliament decided not to allow increasing the levels, that means Switzerland has allowable levels much lower than in the United States and, and many countries and lower than ICNR or FCC limits. So many countries are doing different things. Actually, there's several countries that allow less radiation or have policies promoting uh, less exposures near schools near homes, not allowing cell towers near schools and homes. Uh, and it's all on our site at Environmental Health Trust if you're interested in that as well. And, and there will be information in, on our social media about the efforts around the world to, to stop 5G. We are, um, <clears throat> we are more involved in the research and uh, policy, but we're delighted and really honored to be able to work with people like Kate Keel and Doug and Patty Wood and, and others that have been really instrumental in providing uh, for a broad, broader public understanding of, of the issues. Um, I think that uh, one of the things you might want to talk about that we haven't addressed is the fact that they rely on ICNRP. And um, this is a, a minority, self-controlled, self-appointed, self-monitored private group that reports to nobody and nothing that has a history of years of being funded directly or indirectly by industry. Its total budget doesn't account for all its activities. And so there's, some, there's something you know, there that needs to be further <clears throat> pursued, but it is the authority upon which the US government is relying. Now think about this. We all pay taxes and we're relying on a private group to tell us what our standards should be for phone radiation. I think that that's unconscionable. I think there ought to be an independent National Academy of Engineering and Medicine group that would look at the data and make recommendations. That's never been done. The closest we came was in 2008, or when an Institute of Medicine had a workshop on the issue of, of uh, 
radio frequency radiation. And they had the majority of the people in the workshop were international. Why? Because they had almost no US experts they could get. So whenever you hear the FCC say, we're relying on studies from the US government, show me, you know, where is it? Because the only study from the US government is the one they commissioned from the NTP. And that study not only showed an increase in cancer, but also showed subsequently increased DNA damage. Now DNA damage isn't necessarily mean you're gonna get cancer, but it often happens with it. And so to ignore this science from the government's flagship testing program, because a bunch of people were brought in to spin the science. And so what we have to deal with here is the fact that as the Harvard University Center for Ethics pointed out in 2014, I believe, the FCC is a captured agency. That is the conclusion of a Harvard University investigation of support for the FCC. By that they mean the current heads of the FCC come from industry and will go back to industry. And that revolving door has existed since the 1990s. So it's not a Republican or a Democratic thing. It's all of them. They, this industry has done a superb job of capturing the flag. Now the question is, are they gonna run with it and do the right thing and make the changes that need to be made to make this technology safer? That's what we want. We, are, we want the technology to be made safer. And we know that there are ways to do it because patents are held by Nokia, among others, for how to reduce radiation. And this can and should be done. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll also point out related to ICNRP, um, the uh, amicus brief of Joe Sandri had a declaration by Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who is the former director of the National um, Institute for Environmental Health Sciences and she talks about the NTP study, which you're referring to, and specifically addresses the ICNR and a paper done by Dr. Melnick that talks about the, uh, the, the, the miss, um, the, that the criticisms of the NTP study are actually unfounded. And some of those unfounded criticisms that ICNR put forward are interestingly put forward by the FCC in their brief. It's quite uh, shocking, um, but if you're not technically understanding all of this issue, it's very easy to just not understand that. But if you look at the FCC brief, it's, it's filled with every piece of misinformation that we've seen uh, for decades on this issue. Well, in fairness to the FCC lawyers, <clears throat> they're not scientists, um, they're not biologists, and it shows in what they've written. Now, <clears throat> that's going to be a problem for, for all lawyers, okay? That's a fundamental challenge for democracy. How do judges make decisions when there's complex science? Some people have suggested science courts. Uh, we kind of are on the verge of that now, but <clears throat> it's a challenge, okay? And you're absolutely right. The FCC has mastered the ability to confuse people. And they are themselves confused. I don't doubt that they are. And in the past, I was often invited in to brief the FCC. I haven't been invited in for some time. Well, and thank I you so come. much. <laughs> right. Okay. And we appreciate your support. It is making a huge difference. Please spread the word. Tell, tell your community. Uh, please continue to support Environmental Health Trust and educate others about this issue so that we can make the meaningful policy changes that are needed when it comes to technology. And Happy New Year. And Gamar Chatima Tova to those of you who will, like me, be fasting on Yom Kippur. Thank you. Mm -hmm.